Coming up on Nebraska Stories, the whimsical world of Fred's Flying Circus, the music man behind the College World Series, fighting fire with fire, and a small business with a big mission. It seemed like the more cars went up, more people would stop and take pictures. People from all over. We've even had some people in foreign countries stop by and, and want to take pictures of them and have us talk to them about it. We just had a guy from, I think it was Russia, not too long ago, or, or Yugoslavia or something. Yeah, Yugoslavia. Uh -huh. What people are traveling to see is a collection of whimsical sculptures perched above the Grand Island Body Shop. They are actual cars. The characters are made out of the rebar, chicken wire, and concrete. But the actual cars, they don't have motors in them, but they're very heavy. These high-flying characters owe their existence to the perpetual creativity of Fred Schritt, who was also the body shop owner. He went to work at Green's Body Shop. He was 14 years old and he loved it after that. Then he went to work for Schupens. He worked six days a week. And then in the evenings, he'd go out and paint airplanes to make extra money. Fred was the kind of person who just didn't like sitting still. And so the same year he opened his body shop on the east side of town, he began building and racing custom motorcycles. After a long, successful career in racing, Fred finally hung up his helmet at the age of 70, but he still needed something to do with his spare time. And that's when a little input from his grandson came in handy. He had an old wrecker out here. So then my oldest grandson, Jordan, had suggested it look like Mater from the show Cars. <laughs> You're funny. I like you already. My name's Mater. Mater? Yeah, like tuh mater, but without the tuh. He got the idea of making a wrecker out of it, and then chopped it and did his hot rod thing that he liked doing to it, and making a crazy face on it, and ended up making the wrecker, and then he decided to put it on a pole. And so he ended up talking to this uh, sign company next door, and they he hired him to put in a pole and lift the car up and welded it to the pole, and, and the rest was history. <laughs> But after I built the first car, I was helping my kid. Well, everybody liked her so well, it made me happy, and they was happy, so I built another one. And everything I built, people liked it, so it's actually just like stuck on a building, house or building. On top of the building, he built Snoopy and, you know, the Red Baron and his house. And then the German. That was like an old 65 Volkswagen, and he chopped the end off and he made a tail for it. And then he made a German shooting at Snoopy, and the bullets were made from old spark plugs. Anything he could find he would use on his vehicles. One car is from the Coney Island. There's a restaurant in Grand Island called the Coney Island, and George is the owner, and that's George driving the the Coney car. My dad and him will go way back. He's been a long time customer and he just said one day, he goes, hey, I want to build your Coney cars. Okay, well, don't mind, what do you mean Coney girl? I'll put you on a pole with the rest of the characters. 
I said, okay, do what you want to do. He didn't, didn't want me to look at it until it was about done, so I don't look at it, so it was fine. He goes, that's you? Everybody says, that's you, George, up there. <laughs> that's you. <laughs> yeah, he got me. He was a giving guy. He was big on the Humane Society, helping the dogs and all that. And a lot of good stories about him. Over the years, Fred had many four-legged friends, but a favorite was his yellow lab named Buddy. And it was Buddy who inspired Fred to create the only car that isn't at the body shop. He took it out there and donated it to the Humane Society. And they said that year that they had record-breaking sales of people adopting animals because people would go by and they'd see it. It was way up in the air, the car. Little kids would want to go in and see the dogs. Then after most of the cars were up, one of his friends and him decided they were going to make a sign out front that said, Fred's Flying Circus. I'm not sure exactly how they came up with their flying circus. Between 2009 and 2015, Fred built nearly a dozen cars, but a chronic heart condition caused him to dial back his work. After Fred's health wasn't so good, he started making these characters, just the characters to put on a beam between the poles. On one beam, there is the guitar man, the Smurfette, Tweety Bird. And then he decided he was going to do a minion because he'd seen the movie about the minions in one of the cartoons, and he thought they were pretty neat. But the minion was to remain unfinished, as Fred passed away in early January of 2016. We talked about finishing it. It was about probably a good three years. So I finally got the nerve up to go back there and start messing with it, and finally decided how to go about it. And, and I finally started on it. It took me a while to finish it. I mean, it's such a small character, but he was, he was a master at it. He could have had that probably done in a, a weekend where it took me a few months. <laughs> We called it Fred the Minion, and that was the last thing that we put up. After seeing Fred's collection of work, it may surprise you to know Fred never considered himself an artist. Actually, one day he was talking about that. I'm not a very good artist. I can't even draw. All I can do is stick people. Just because he couldn't draw a picture of a person or their face, I looked around and I was like, Fred, <laughs> you're an artist. <laughs> Baseball fans from across the country travel to Omaha each summer to watch college baseball's best play the game. There's one guy in the ballpark, though, who's more focused on what fans hear than what they see. Jerry Pollock is a player who never takes the field. He's the organ player, a guy who can score big with the fans, not by hitting a baseball, but by hitting just the right notes at the right time. I feel the crowd, and I know if they're really into the game and doing a lot of cheering and stuff, and um, I'll play appropriate songs for that, and um, that's what I try to do. Jerry was born in Chicago in the early 1940s, appropriately the same week and in the same city where the first organ music was played at a Major League Baseball game. He came from a musical family and started taking lessons when he was about six, but not on the organ. I started on the accordion, took piano lessons till I was 16, and uh, discovered girls and the music went away. But I reinvented myself at age 23 when we started with the organ. Jerry says he was fascinated by the organ and eventually got good enough to play publicly. The restaurants in Chicago in the day, in the 50s and the 60s, 
had organ bars. And I went to a couple of those places and I said, you know, I think I can play better than the guy who's there and walked into my first restaurant that I played at for 16 years and uh, did a little audition and he says, our organist just quit, you got the job. His work with the Burlington Railroad eventually brought him to Nebraska. And a decade later, when the College World Series moved from its longtime home at Rosenblatt Stadium to the new TD Ameritrade Park, longtime organist Lambert Bartak, who had played at the World Series for 43 years, decided not to make the move. He didn't want to move here, and they were doing auditions, and um, I, I went to the audition, and um, they hired me right on the spot, so, so to speak. Yeah, so that's, that started 10 years ago, and I'm still here. Bartek's words of wisdom for the new organist in the seat were limited. I did talk to him a couple of days before I started here, and he just says, you're a professional, you'll figure it out. And that he did. Jerry's two-week summer job during the College World Series can include some very long days. He's usually at the ballpark a couple of hours before the first pitch. And if it's a doubleheader or the game goes into extra innings, he might not make it back to his hotel until well after midnight, only to get up the next day and do it again. The job has its perks, though, including a great seat for the games. I have a fantastic view. I'm on the fourth floor above home plate. I can see the whole field. A seat any baseball fan would love. But even though Jerry's played for hundreds of games and seen some great ones, he doesn't consider himself a baseball fan. Truthfully, I'm not. I'm not a sports fan. Um, uh, I grew up with a musical family, and we did music, and um, none of my family plays sports, so. Jerry does pay close attention to each game, though. He's all business when he's in the booth. Basically, this is a show. Um, it's entertainment. It's a show, and my job is to entertain people. He does that by relying on his years of experience to play the right song. He has what he calls his Bible close by. It's filled with many pages of sheet music. But he's played so long, he doesn't really need to have a sheet of music to help him get to where he wants to take the song. I used to use sheet music, and the sheet music is written by somebody else, and I would rather interpretate the song to my own uh, feelings than play somebody else's arrangement. So Jerry lets what's happening on the field guide what he plays on the organ. For example, if it's raining, Jerry's always ready with a song. Raindrops are falling on your head, stormy weather, um, here comes that rainy day. But every baseball organist knows there is one song at one time each night during which they'd better be on their musical game. The seventh inning stretch um, uh, is, a mo is a reason, the most important reason why I'm here. Everybody likes to sing, take me out to the ball game. And when the whole crowd is standing and singing to his music? I feel great. The, the louder they sing, the greater I feel. So, what could Jerry possibly do to top that feeling? How about shopping? or actually playing three afternoons a week for the shoppers at the Von Mar department store in Lincoln. Here, he trades his fun-loving organ music for some softer background melodies on the piano. It's a whole different venue being at the College World Series Park um, with all the background noise and everything that I have to play it. This is more intimate. Uh, the atmosphere here is more intimate. I get to meet people, they walk by and, 
and want to talk about the piano or a song that they want to hear. Sometimes they sit in the couches here and uh, um, I ask them if they have a particular song that they'd like to hear and uh, it's uh, a little more rewarding, a little more personal than it is in the big park. Whether it's the cheers from a large crowd or a smile from a single shopper, for Jerry, it's all about the people enjoying his music. My favorite thing is when somebody is walking down the aisle, um, in and out of the store, and um, they're dancing, more or less walk dancing to the music. That's the most um, thing that I appreciate. And his fans appreciate him, whether it's in the aisles of a clothing store or in the cheap seats at the ballpark. Jerry Pollock's music is a big winner in Nebraska, and so is he. When I enter the room, usually um, the guy, the uh, techs in the room call me the legend, but I, I don't feel that way. I'm just here to do a job and have a good time, and hopefully the audience has a good time as well. We've learned in the past 10 years that fire is not always bad. We have understood that we can control fire with fire, and it has a huge impact on the regrowth and the forest of our area. I'm the fire chief for the Gearing Fire Department. We are in Cedar Canyon Wildlife Management Area, which is about seven miles southwest of Gearing, Nebraska. You know, the Wildcat Hills is a gorgeous area, unlike anywhere else in Nebraska. It's a span of hills, different bluffs and buttes that start somewhere in Wyoming, Nebraska border, and go closer to Bridgeport. We've seen fire behavior that we haven't seen in the past. About two or three years ago, we had the idea that maybe we can create a fire exercise and bring people in from around the area to help with some type of team and firefighters that are truly qualified to manage this fire. We're getting our firefighters out here to recognize the terrain. They're getting in the ability to see what they're up against in the event that we do have a large fire that comes through here. We have 27 engines from Pueblo, Colorado, Colorado Springs, Cheyenne and Laramie. Imperial, Madrid, Keystone, Lemoyne, Oilala, Baird, and then we have Nebraska State overhead from Emergency Management, Nebraska National Guard, State Fire Marshal's Office, and Nebraska Forest Service. We really found a need that we need to have some aerial resources in Nebraska. So can I pick him up direct, or do you want me to come to you? No, you can pick those up direct. Communication is always the biggest issue we run into. Statistically, you've seen a lot of firefighter fatalities and injuries result from communication issues. 
So we're trying to really beef up our understanding and our training and communication with aircraft. Reese Flowers, 23. Go ahead, Clark. Hey, I just got a hold of Ops. Um, they gave me permission to take this applicator and start pre-treating this candy bias. Uh, copy that. When you see growth and overgrowth of fuels, and when we're talking fuels, shrubs, grasses, trees, the minute that they become more dense in drier seasons, if there is a fire that's affected in the area, let's say it's caused by lightning, you're gonna have that fire move into those fuels at a much faster rate, at a much hotter environment, that it's gonna decimate the whole forest. So when you're able to produce a low intensity fire, thin the forest out and put fire on the ground, ponderosas react in a way that it's gonna release its seeds and it's gonna drop on the ground and regenerate a lot healthier. The grasses are gonna come back greener for the elk, for the sheep, for the deer that are in this area. The shrubs are gonna be decreased so that way we don't have that really hot fire behavior move through the land. The fire service is a family. Every single firefighter that's on the ground, 98% of them are volunteers in every community in Nebraska. You belong on a fire department, you're a firefighter. If you look at that demographic, there's a whole host of negative outcomes that are associated with it. But I think the thing that really stood out the most is there's a 50% unemployment rate in that demographic. We started this bike shop, coffee shop, as a means to provide workforce development for young adults who've been, been impacted by the foster care system. coffee our bottom line is not profits our bottom line is the programming so the programming that we provide is financial literacy we provide personal budgeting help we do cooking and nutrition classes we do mindfulness meditation we have a book club we do academic tutoring we do some art therapy projects there's just a lot of things that we do to kind of supplement the job stuff you want to get a filter from underneath there in the mouth I, I really think Valerie's is one of my favorites just because, you know, when she came here, she was homeless. Her anxiety was so great that she wouldn't talk to people and, like, would not answer you. I really look at this place as, like, my family. Like, we're not related by blood, but we've all been through so many similar things, and even here, it's been a journey together, and it's like, especially with my bosses, they're, like, my main support group. I can ask them about, like, anything, and they'll help me. Getting her here and just like seeing what a like engaging, intelligent person she was that was just like existing in this world by herself. And so she gradually starts to come out of her shell and then she starts to really become the like a great barista and she 
And then, then you start to see the leadership qualities in her. Is it expanding? Yep. You blossom them perfectly then. Changed my life completely. Completely. I think as a society, we're kind of making it seem okay for them to be a disposable demographic. We know that young adults age out of foster care system, and we know the negative outcomes that they face, but it's something that continues to happen. The only conclusion to draw is that we view them as a disposable demographic, and I think that's something that it really makes me angry, and it, you know, it's something that I want to make sure that we fix. <laughs> Watch more Nebraska Stories on our website, Facebook, and YouTube. Nebraska Stories is funded in part by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation.